Greetings. This is information for Unit 3, and for this unit I have two different examples to go over. And the first example will be an independent samples test, where we're looking at differences between groups in their means, a difference in means between two groups. And this example comes from researchers at University of Denver, uh, Scott Stanley, Howard Markman, and also a few others that they were working with in this particular project. And they were wanting to look at the question about whether it's useful if a couple is engaged to be married, if they're planning to get married, is it useful for them to get some kind of premarital education where they might go, uh, maybe it's a weekend program or maybe a couple weekends where they have someone that goes over talking about what to expect when they get married and also talking about communication skills and skills for uh, building a stable, strong, lasting, happy relationship together. Is that a useful thing? There's a lot of programs out there would seem like it would be a good thing, but uh, that's also an empirical question. How helpful really is that? Uh, this particular study uh, was a situation where they uh, were working with some people in the state of Oklahoma and arranged to do a fairly large telephone survey uh, of 1,977 people, and these were all people who were married, and uh, they just uh, asked them a few simple questions, and so uh, because it was a fairly short survey, they got a lot of people to participate and got a good representation of the population in that state. Uh, so the first question was simply, did you, these are all married people, so they asked, did you have premarital education? Did you have some kind of education program before you got married? Did you do something? Yes or no? And that created our two groups. So we have one group of people that said, yes, we received some kind of education. Another group said, no, we did not receive any education. And then they measured what they called commitment, or I might actually call this relationship satisfaction, but we can call this satisfaction commitment. How happy and stable is your relationship is essentially what this is measuring. Three very quick items. Uh, they asked these people over the phone, say on a, a five-point scale, to what extent would you say my relationship is more important to me than almost anything else in my life? Uh, number two, I may not want to be with my spouse a few years from now, and that's reverse coded so that if you say yes to that, it gives you a lower score. And number three, I think my spouse and me are more in terms of us and we rather than me and him, her. Uh, so they asked those questions over the phone and they rated each one on a five-point scale. They added them together to get a total commitment score or a total satisfaction score, whatever we want to call this. So we can ask the question, is there a difference between uh, the people that received the education and those that didn't in their levels of relationship commitment or relationship satisfaction? Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that this study has an advantage in that because this was such a short, brief telephone survey, they got a lot of people to participate and got a representative sample uh, of people living in the state of Oklahoma. So that's a strength of the study. But the trade-off was is that they were limited to just a few short questions. Uh, and uh, so, for example, if we say, did you have premarital education? Well, that could mean almost anything. I mean, who knows what that, if they say yes, was that they sat down with maybe, uh, maybe they were going to a church and a pastor said, well, let's have you sit down here and uh, we'll do a little five minute thing where I look and say, you know, you both come from great families. I'm sure you have no troubles. You're all set. There you go. There's your premarital education. Um, which if it was that, it probably wasn't uh, all that helpful. So, or was it where they uh, went through a full program, uh, the people doing this study at University of Denver, they actually have a program they call the PrEP program, uh, which uh, couples come in and they, it goes over a few different weekends and it's several hours long and they have coaches that are trained and they have manuals uh, and it's based on training people to do things in their relationships that research has found to be generally helpful. Um, so if someone said, yes, I received education, we really have no idea what that might be. Um, Another limitation, if you note at our uh, commitment scale here, that uh, just three items, it's hard to get a very reliable measure of satisfaction. And indeed, if we look at our alpha, our reliability was 0.69. That falls just below the threshold what, of what we would call good or adequate reliability. Uh, so it's um, our reliability, there's a bit poor. Uh, and so there's a couple trade-offs we've made in terms of trying to make a, a short survey to get everyone in terms of the quality of the measures. Also note that this is 
the design here is a correlational design. We're not going to be able to determine cause and effect because we're not randomly assigning people to groups. If we wanted to do an experiment and randomly assign people to either get the education and not get the education, and then maybe trap and follow those people over the course of their entire relationships to see who has happy, lasting, stable relationships and who doesn't, uh, that type of design would allow us to determine cause and effect. But of course, that would be a very difficult study to do, and it would be hard to get a random sample of people to force them to participate in that type of study. Uh, so what we're looking at here is essentially a correlational design. If we find a difference between groups, we don't know the direction of effects. It might be that maybe the relationship, if we find that people that received the education are better off than those who didn't, it might be that the education helped them. Or maybe it's the types of people that are destined to have happy, stable, lasting relationships are the types of people that opt into uh, getting education, the ones that seek it out or are likely to accept it. Um, so even if we do find a difference between groups, we don't know direction of effects. We don't know, does that mean that the education helps people have happy relationships? Or does that mean that people in happy relationships tend to like to enroll in education programs for their relationships? Uh, but still, at the same time, I think this is a valuable thing to look at because if we want to ask the question, is education helpful and how helpful is it, we would expect to see at least some degree of difference between the two groups in uh, how happy they are or their level of commitment. Uh, we would expect to see that if you receive the education, you're going to have higher levels of commitment than those that don't. And if we don't even find a difference between groups, that would be kind of discouraging news for the overall promise of giving couples premarital education or maybe it means that we need to revise it or make it better. Uh, but, it, but if education's helpful, we'd expect to see some degree of difference between groups. Okay, here are results from their study. Um, and they look like this. This is SPSS output for uh, these results. And let's see what we have here. So at the very top, uh, where it says group statistics, it gives us our sample sizes. So there were 1,365 people that said they received no education. There were 612 people who said they received some kind of education. The mean for the people with no education on this commitment scale was 11.12. And for the people who said they received education, it was 11.64. So if I'm just going to kind of ballpark around this, there's about a half a point of difference between those two groups. Now, at this point, just to say there's a half a point of difference, we don't know is that a big difference? Is that a small difference? I mean, a half a point could, depending on the scale, a half a point could be a, a fairly sizable difference. Or maybe it's a trivial dif difference. And we're going to get some information on that if we look at our standard deviations. Now, in a little bit, uh, I'll want you to calculate the D statistic and get precisely exactly what is the difference between these two groups in standard deviation units so we know what our effect size is. But even without calculating our D statistic precisely, we can get a ballpark estimate here, because if we look at our standard deviations, we've got 2.39, 2.5. Our difference between means is about 0.5. To do some really rough rounding here, we've got about, if I just round the standard deviations to 2.5 and the difference to 0.5, it looks like a fairly small difference. That is, the difference between means is about one-fifth of a standard deviation. That would give us a D statistic of 0.2. So we're looking, just, just eyeballing this, I'm not even uh, plugging in my calculator here or anything, just looking at it just in general, it looks like we've got about a D statistic of 0.2, which would be a very small effect. Um, so if we were hoping to get all excited about some major effect here, uh, we're not going to get that excited here because our effect is looking very small. Now, that doesn't answer the question, is our effect significant? Uh, that's the question that we want to do. We're going to do that with a t-test uh, to see can we reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the effect is zero, and we want to see can we reject that and, and at least claim that we have some effect that's uh, bigger than zero. Uh, and um, we'll get to that in just a moment, but let's see what else we have on this output. Um, over at the right here, it says standard error of the mean, so we have two means, the mean for the education group and the no education group, and each mean has a standard error. So the standard error of the mean for the education group is 0 0.10. Standard error of the mean for the no education group is 0 0.07. Recall those standard errors of a mean tell you if you do the study over and over again, 
How much does this mean? So for example, we've got the no education group 11.12. How much would that mean that we got, for example, 11.12? How much is that likely to deviate from the true population parameter if we do our study over and over again? And on average, we will deviate 0.07 units from the true population parameter. Uh, these are fairly small standard errors, and the reason for that is, is that we have very large sample here, especially for the no education group. Uh, a lot of people in that group, and so that standard error is really small, just 0 0.07, just a tiny little it's a bit standard error. In other words, this mean for the no education group, 11.12, we are estimating that very precisely. If we do our study again with another sample of 1,365 people, we have so many people if we do our study again, we're going to get results that are almost identical to what we got in this study. We're going to get hardly any fluctuations from one study to the next. Uh, so that's what we have in that upper table. Let's look down here at this lower section. What do we have down here? The very first thing on the, on the far left, it says Levine's test for equality of variances. Uh, and you want to note that that is not our t-test. This is the test for equality of variances. Recall that one of the assumptions of a t-test is that if you have two groups, we're testing for differences between the two groups and their means, but one of the assumptions is that their standard deviations or their variances are the same. Uh, so we've got 2.5, 2.39, those are the standard deviations, or we could square them, get the variances. And when we do our T formula, we pool our variances together to get a pooled variance based on the average of the two variances from both groups. And that's based on the assumption that although the, the means are different, how far the scores are spread out is about the same in both groups within the population. And if that were not true, we would be violating the assumption of the t-test. And that would mean that our t-test wouldn't work quite right and it wouldn't give us a precise value that we'd want it to give us. So the Levine's test for equality of variance. Now what we're going to do here is this is kind of a significance test turned on its head. It's upside down. And that in this case, we want things to be non-significant. Usually when we do a significance test, we want things to be significant. But this is testing to see, do we have a significant difference between standard deviations or a significant difference between variances between our two groups? And we don't want to have a difference because if we did have a difference, we would be violating an assumption of the t-test. So in this case, we're actually hoping that we have no significant difference. Now, I might mention this one little flaw in the thinking behind what, what we do here. Um, Although this is what everyone does, it's the, the natural way to do it, and so I'll, we'll, we'll just do this how everyone does it. But I want to make you aware that there's a certain bit of nonsensicalness to this because recall that the thing that determines whether something is significant, or one of the things that's really important here, is the size of your sample. If you have a big sample, it's going to make just about everything significant. If you have a small sample, it'll make almost nothing significant. Um, so if you're concerned about violating the assumption here, you want to make your Levine's test non-significant, well, you can fix that by just having a very small sample, and it's almost sure to be non-significant. So it's a little bit funny that we're trying to uh, uh, base our assumption here on something that's influenced by the size of our sample, and it doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense there. But nevertheless, that's what the tradition is, and we will just follow the tradition here. And so the tradition is we look at this Levine's test for equality of variance, uh, and actually, the actual test that's usually done for this is actually a different type of a t-test, but SBSS doesn't want to confuse us here, so what they've done is they've converted a t into an f and given us an f value and a significance. And the key thing to note here is that if that, sig if that significance is less than 0.05, it means we have violated the assumption, or we're going to use that as that's the threshold we use and say we have violated an assumption uh, of equality of variances. In this case, our p-value is not less than 0.05, it's uh, 0.31, so that's not less than 0.05, so it's not significant, which is actually kind of amazing given that we have such a huge sample here. Uh, we still manage to get uh, two variances that are close enough that they're not significantly different from each other. So, because this Levine's test for equality of variance, the significance the p-value, whenever you see all, all this output, by the way, whenever it says SIG in, SP, in SPSS output, SIG is the same thing as the p-value. If you want to know what a p-value is, SIG is always going to be uh, the, the uh, symbol it uses for a p-value. So our p-value here, our significance is 0.31, 
And that's not less than 0.05. It's not significant, so we have not violated an assumption. Now, if we had violated an assumption, the output here gives us two different lines here. It's one who says equality variance is assumed. The second line says equality variance is not assumed. And it's actually, if we had violated that assumption, it actually would have been very easy because this bottom line here gives us output that is not based on an assumption of equality of variances. And so if we had violated that assumption, if our Levine's test for equality variances had a p-value that was less than 0.05, if that was significant, we could then just go down to the second line here and look at this data or this output, these results, on that second uh, line, and that gives us results that don't require that assumption. It's been adjusted uh, so that it's not requiring that assumption of equality variances. Now, in real life, people rarely ever do that. I can't actually recall ever reading a journal article where someone said, oh, we did a t-test, and we checked, we did the Levine's test for equality of variances first, and we discovered we violated the assumption of equality of variances, so then we adjusted our uh, t-value and reporting uh, uh, adjusted values where equality of variances is not assumed. Um, kind of according to the textbook way of doing things, that's what you're supposed to do. In real life, I've actually never recall anyone doing that. And partly the issue here is that usually the difference between the two is very, very slight. Uh, and we'll see that in these results here. If you compare the two rows here, we'll see there's not hardly any difference between uh, the two rows and the results. And that's very common that even when you do violate that assumption, oftentimes it's not a big deal. Um, given that people in, in real life often don't look at that second row, uh, given there's often not a whole lot of difference, I'm not going to make a big deal about here. And actually, my intent for this class will be that I will never give you uh, an assignment or a test item or a homework item where we violated the assumption and where I want you to look at that second row. If you ever see something like that, it probably means I made a mistake and I didn't intend for you to have to do it. So to make things easy, whenever you look this out, but if you want to, you could just scribble out, scribble, 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 scribble out that second row uh, because... Uh, I will never actually ask you to do anything with it. Now, I do want you to know what Levine's test for equality of variances is for, and I want you to know that if that Levine's test for equality of variances is significant, if the p-value is point, less than 0.05, that means we have a significant difference between groups in their standard deviations, in their variances, and therefore we have violated an assumption of the t-test. So I do want you to know that much. Um, but I'm never going to give you an example where that's significant, and then I want you to interpret the other results. I just want you to know what it's for, how to use it. Um, but in the examples we do, I will always plan to give you examples where we don't violate that assumption. Okay, now let's look at the part of our output here that's the uh, significance test to see if we have a difference between means. So we have a T value here. This is where it says T. That is the T value for the actual difference between the two means. So our T is 4.31. Uh, our degrees of freedom, 1,975. And the P-value, or significance, it says 0 .000. And keep in mind that your, your P-value, or your significance, your P-value can never be exactly zero. Um, that's not possible to have a probability of zero. It always has to be some value. It's just, in this case, it's just rounded to something so small that it rounds to zero. If we carried it out enough decimal places, it would be 0 .0000 something. Um, so we can just say it's something, we know it's less than 0 .001, at least that, which is a very small uh, example. In other words, if the null hypothesis were true, if there was actually no difference between these two groups, uh, in their means, if, if the difference was exactly zero in the population, uh, the probability of doing a study and getting a result of, of this size of difference, even though it's just a half a point of difference between the two groups, uh, we have such a huge sample, the probability of getting that big of a difference is something that would happen less than once in a thousand times. Incredibly improbable to get this big a difference uh, just by chance alone. And the issue here is not that our difference is so big, but rather our samples are so large uh, that our standard errors are so small that it would be unusual to get anything that varies hardly anything from this. And so the likelihood that the difference is actually just exactly zero, that's highly improbable. At least it's highly improbable that we would get these results if that were true. So these, we do have a significant difference. So uh, kind of the big questions, 
how big is the difference? Well, it looks like we have a fairly small difference. We're kind of estimating our statistics to be around 0.2, about one-fifth of a standard deviation of difference between the two groups. So it looks like we have a small difference, but we definitely have a significant difference. In other words, we can reject that null hypothesis and say uh, the difference is not zero. We have an effect. We have discovered something. Uh, the difference between groups is not zero. There is a difference between two groups. What else do we have here? Here, where it says mean difference, that is just the uh, difference between these two means. Uh, when I was eyeballing it, I said it looked like it was about a, a half a point of difference, precisely 11.12 minus 11.64 equals negative 0.52. That's the actual size of the difference. And then we have the standard error of the difference between the means. Keep in mind that we have two types of standard errors here. We have the standard error of the mean. We have two groups. Each group has a mean, and each of those means has a standard error. And then we have a difference between the two groups. Here's our difference is 0.52, or negative 0.52, and a standard error of that difference. So we have a standard error of the mean for group one. We have a mean for group two, and a standard error of the mean for group two. And we have a difference between two groups, a difference between means, and a standard error of difference. And then finally, we have a confidence interval. Uh, we talked about in class about how to calculate a confidence interval. And if we calculate that, we can be 95% confident. And this is the confidence interval for the difference. So our difference was 0.52 or negative 0.52. We can be 95% confident in the population. The true difference between means is somewhere between negative 0.75 and negative 0.28. So that's what we have in our output. Now the next question is, what are all the things that I might ask you to do with this output? Well, let's see. One thing I might ask you to do is to just calculate this mean difference. So that we got a mean difference of negative 0.52. I might just scribble that out or make it blank and say, here, you calculate. You tell me what that difference is, and that's pretty easy to do. You just take the mean for group one minus the mean for group two, 11.12 minus 11.64, and you would get the difference between the two means. Another thing I might ask you to do is to calculate these standard errors of the mean. So we have the standard error of the mean for group one, standard error of the mean for group two. I might scribble those out and say, here, you calculate, you tell me what those standard errors are. And down at the bottom here, I have our formula for the standard error of the mean. Standard deviation divided by the square root of n will give you the standard error of a mean. And so for group one, uh, the no education group, their standard deviation was 2.5. Their sample size was 1,365. So I just plug those two things here, 2.5 divided by the square root of 1,365. And note that uh, we're, we're using the entire sample size for that group, not the degrees of freedom. So 2.5 divided by the square root of 1,365, and I get 0 0.0677, which would round to 0 0.07, which is what we see up here. Or we can calculate it for group two, the education group. I get 0 0.0967, which it would round to 0 0.10 right there. So that is how to calculate the standard error of the mean for each group. What else? Um, well, I might ask you to calculate the standard error of difference, the standard error of difference between two means. Um, and if we wanted to do that, we'd have to do a few steps to get there first. And the first thing we would want to do is to calculate the pooled variance. Um, and to calculate the pooled variance, what I need to know is the variance of each group. So we currently know the standard deviation of each group. But to calculate the pooled variance, I need to go back and get the, actually, I need to go back and get these sums of squares for each group. So what I'm going to do, say, for example, I'll take uh, group one, the no education group. Their standard deviation was 2.5. And I'm going to square that and then multiply that by degrees of freedom, the group size minus one. So they had 1,365 people. Take n minus one, get 1,364. So get the standard deviation squared times degrees of freedom to get my sums of squares, 8,525. And then I'm going to get the sums of squares for group two, the people that received education, same thing. Take the standard deviation squared to get variance, multiply the variance by my degrees of freedom, and I get 3,490.09. 
So now I've got my two sums of squares and I can calculate my pooled variance. Down at the bottom we have the formula for our pooled variance. SD squared is a variance, so SD squared subscript pooled stands for pooled variance. And I need to get the sums of squares for group one plus the sums of squares for group two in my numerator and then sum the two degrees of freedom in my denominator. So I take 8,525 plus 3,490.09, add those together, add my two sums of squares together, then add my two degrees of freedom together, or if you want, you could just take the total sample size, minus two, it's the same thing, or uh, degrees of freedom for group one, plus degrees of freedom for group two, in each case it's n minus one for each group, or total sample size minus two. And I get a pooled, uh, uh, pooled variance of 6.0836. Okay, so that's my pooled variance. So let's save that number. I'm going to put it right up here. My pooled variance, 6.0836. Save that right there in my upper right-hand corner because I'm going to need that in just a moment here because the next thing I'm going to ask you about is to compute the standard error of the difference between means or standard error of the mean difference or standard error of the difference. So we see that our standard error of a difference is 0.12, but if I scribble that out, say so here, I scribble, 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 Lock it out and say, you calculate, you tell me what that is. And you can do that. Here's our formula for the standard error of, uh, of a difference. And we need to take the square root of pooled variance divided by n minus 1 plus pooled variance divided by n minus 2. And note that we've got the, in the denominators here, we've got the sample size for group 1 and the sample size for group 2. Those will be two different sample sizes unless we happen to have equal numbers of people in each group, but that's kind of rare to have that happen. But this pooled variance, that's the same value. We put that exact same value in both places. So let's see, go over to our, so we take our pooled variance, 6.0836, and I plug it in there. Take that exact same value and plug it in right there. And, and then for this first one here, I take 6.0836 divided by the sample size for group one, Group 1 had 1,365 people. Group 2 had 612 people, and so that goes right down there. And again, note that I'm dividing by the total sample sizes, and I'm not dividing by degrees of freedom here. It's divided by the sample size. And plug that out in, and I get a standard error of difference of uh, 0.11999, uh, which would round to 0.12. And so that's how we'd calculate the standard error of difference. Uh, what else? Well, we could ask you to calculate the t value. So here we have a t value of negative 4.31. I could scribble that out and ask you to calculate it. And that's easy to do because the t value is always a statistic divided by its standard error. And so in this case, our statistic is the difference between the two groups, the mean difference. So our mean difference is negative 0.52. And if that wasn't given there, you could easily just get that 11.12 minus 11.64 and get it that way. Either way, you can get our mean difference. And we just calculate our standard error difference of 0.12, or a moment ago we came at exactly at 0.11999. Uh, and, uh, and I get negative 4.33, which actually, if you note, we're a bit off. Here we got 4.31. Here's negative 4.33. They don't exactly match. And that's simply because in all this process of calculating, some of these values that I'm, I'm calculating things based on values given in this, this table here. And some of these values in the table have been rounded. Uh, and so we're making calculations based off of rounded values. And because of that, we ended up with, with an answer here that was just a little bit different than what it is in the table. We did everything right. It's just that because we're making calculations with rounded values, it didn't come out exactly right in this, this case. Now, on a test or homework, if I had scribbled this out, there's no way knowing what that was. And the correct answer in that case uh, would be negative 4.33 because I'd assume you're calculating using the data that I gave you, given the output I gave you. So the correct answer is the answer you'd get using the output that you're dealing with. So if this were a test or homework item, the correct answer I'd be looking for would be negative 4.33. Which, by the way, uh, on tests, if you want to leave off the negative sign for a t value, you 
be fine to do that, and I would not mark you off. Because with a T value, the negative sign is simply arbitrary. It just happens to be with what group did you call group one, and which group was group two, or uh, group zero, or however you want to, uh, however you've numbered them. But w which group was first, what group was second. Um, and, uh, and if we reverse the order and had the no education group uh, second and the education group first, if we reverse the order, then we'd have a positive T value. So the negative sign on a T value is purely arbitrary. Uh, so on a test, I would not count you off if you left off the negative sign. But keep in mind, if you're doing homeworks and entering data, uh, entering your answers on Canvas, Canvas does not necessarily know any better. A canvas isn't quite so smart to determine, wait a minute, this is a t-test. Because there's a lot of situations, most times when we get negative values in this class, those negative values mean something and they're consequential. Uh, for example, if we get a correlation, a negative correlation means that we have an inverse relationship where a positive correlation means we have a positive relationship. So for the most times, most part, uh, negative and positive, positive signs are important. Uh, but for a T value, this is one case where actually the negative sign is, is inconsequential. Um, and, uh, but for homeworks, submitting stuff on Canvas, still keep the signs there because that program might not know any better and it might get, you might get counted wrong if you kept the negative sign. But if you want to on a test, you could leave off the negative sign and I wouldn't notice it. Uh, what else could we do? We could have you compute the uh, T value there. We could also calculate the degrees of freedom. Uh, that would be fairly straightforward. Uh, the total sample size, minus 2. Or you could take the people in group 1, 1,365, minus 1, plus 612, minus 1, uh, which, which again would give you the total sample size, minus 2, we get 1,975. So you could calculate the degrees of freedom if I asked you to. Um, now let's calculate that D statistic. When we first started, we kind of gave a rough eyeball here estimate, and we saw that it looked like it was about uh, D statistic of about 0.2 or so. Let's see exactly how close we are. So again, a D statistic is a difference between two means uh, divided by the pooled standard deviation. And we already calculated the pooled variance. Again, I put it up here again, it's pooled variance 6.0836. We did that back a few steps ago. And uh, hopefully you've saved that and not deleted it. If you deleted it, you'll have to calculate it again. Uh, but we have that pooled variance, so we just take the square root of that pooled variance, and we have a pooled standard deviation. So the D statistic, I take my mean difference, negative 0.52, divided by the square root of my pooled variance, which will give me the pooled standard deviation, and I get a D statistic of negative 0.211. Indeed, we were fairly close when I said the D looked like it was about 0.2. It's pretty close, 0.211, so pretty close to that. Uh, and again, that's a very small D statistic. It just barely crosses the threshold of what we might call a small effect. Uh, now, as an alternate, we could also calculate a different effect size. Uh, this isn't as typical and... Uh, and in general, I would say that whenever we're looking at a difference between two groups, looking at a difference in means between two groups, by default, the natural effect size to report will always be a D statistic. But um, if we wanted to, we could be kind of radical and different and go off and do things our own way and we could say, well, I'd rather report a correlation. And we could do that if we wanted to. And if we report a correlation, this is going to be called a point by serial correlation. Uh, people often don't use that term, but uh, if you want to be precise and give it a name, we could say it's a point by serial correlation, just meaning that it's a correlation between two variables and, oh, by the way, one of our variables is dichotomous, uh, has only two categories to it. And uh, so we call that a point by serial correlation. If one of our variables happens to be a dichotomous variable with only two values, it's a point by serial correlation. doesn't mean anything other than that. Uh, and... Um, it's still a correlation, still the correlation formula, and we're simply taking what is the correlation between uh, group membership, for example, if we called people in the no education group, if we called, if we gave everyone that, in that group a score of one, everyone in the education group, maybe they get a score of zero, so we've given the two numbers, uh, we've got your groups, either one or zero for your group membership, and then we just run a correlation between that group membership variable and the outcome, which is the commitment or relationship satisfaction variable. So what's the correlation between group, group membership and commitment or satisfaction? 
And we could uh, pull up our formula for a correlation, calculate the covariance, take the covariance divided by the product of two standard deviations to calculate a, a correlation. Uh, although we don't need to do that here because we've gotten a t-value right here. And we know our degrees of freedom. We could, calculate, we could add that up or we could just see it right there. And if we have a t-value and degrees of freedom, we can easily just plug in the shortcut formula which is a formula that actually comes in handy in many different situations, the square root of t squared divided by t squared plus degrees of freedom. So let's just plug all that in. Our t is 4.31 and plug it in the numerator and then 4.31 squared plus degrees of freedom, 1,975, pl plug all that in and we get a point by serial correlation of 0 0.0965. Or with rounding, that would round to a correlation of about 0.1 um, and if we think in terms of effect size, the point 0.1 for a correlation is right at that threshold of what we would call a small effect. Uh, the, the, when I set the cutoffs for small, medium, large in terms of a correlation or a D statistic, uh, those don't perfectly match up and we can see actually our correlation technically fell just right below that threshold to what we might call a trivial correlation where our T statistic fell just right on the other side, fell on the side above it where we'd call it a small effect. Um, that's because we've given nice even values for what we call small, even, large. And so the correlation that they don't exactly perfectly match uh, each other. Um, a you know, typically, we wouldn't calculate a correlation for this type of, of data set, but we could, and this is how we would do it. Uh, what else? I might ask you to calculate the p-value. Actually, let me back up to that previous page. And here is our p-value right here, 0 0.000 something. We don't know exactly what it is. It's something less than 0 0.001, something that rounds to 0 0.000. Um, very, very tiny, itsy bitsy small p-value. But what if I scribble that out and ask you to tell me what that p-value is? Now, at this point, you would either need to use an app or, uh, or I suppose if you have a very high-powered calculating brain, you could use your own brain, but very, very few people do that. Um, you could use an app or Google uh, search for an online calculator uh, that would give you t-values, or you could find a t-table and get the values that way. Uh, the natu easiest way to do it is to use a calculator or uh, app. But for this class, for homeworks, and more importantly on tests, uh, just like the z-table, we will be using paper tables to look up t-values. And here is how the table works. Now, one thing to note in this table is that uh, you are not going to be able to give me a precise p-value. We cannot say p is exactly equal to, you know, like 0.032 or something like that. Uh, but instead, we're going to be dealing with inequalities. Uh, and also recall that part of the thing with a t-table is that we have... Uh, essentially, the t-distribution is a different distribution for every different degrees of freedom. So if you have a sample size of 50 people with 48 degrees of freedom, that'll be your t-distribution will have one shape. If you add another person to your sample, that'll slightly change the shape of the t-distribution. So every different sample size, that is every different degrees of freedom, is going to have a different shape to the t-distribution. So if you recall what the z-table looked like, the z-table actually takes up but three, four pages of, of, of text to give you the entire Z table, uh, at least is the way it's uh, done uh, typically. And um, so if you take, you know, maybe it's a four pages of text to give the entire table. So to actually give you the T table, we'd actually need to give you those four pages for every possible sample size. So here's four pages of T table text for a sample of one person. Here's four pages of text for a sample of two people. Here's four pages of text for a sample of three people and so forth, or I guess we actually do degrees of freedom technically, which is n minus two, total sample size minus two. But we need a separate T table for every single possible sample size. And that would make a huge, we'd have like a huge volume uh, uh, of a book just to give us all those T values. So we are going to greatly simplify things here. And th this table is just going to give us critical values, cutoff values that we can use uh, so that we can use inequalities to make a statement such as, is P less than 0.05? That is, is it significant? Uh, is it less uh, than point, uh, is it less than 0.02? Is it less than 0.01? And is it less than 0.001? So we're going to deal with inequalities here. And uh, so looking at this table, actually I'm going to zoom in just a bit here. 
So there we go. I've zoomed in a bit and cut out some of the tables so we can see things up close. Uh, one thing to note is that we have two types of significance. We have significance. It says levels of significance for a one-tailed test and levels for a two-tailed test. Um, that goes back to that issue of uh, if you're looking at probabilities, what's the probability of getting a, a score this high or this low uh, if the null hypothesis is true? A one-tailed test is only going to go in one direction. So I might, if I have a high value, I'll say, what's the probability of a score higher than this? If I have a low value, I'll say, what's the probability of getting a score lower than this? But I won't go in both directions. A two-tailed test is the one that says, what's the probability of getting a score more extreme than this in either direction, higher than the high value or lower than the low value uh, in a symmetrical distribution? And um, now one thing to note is that uh, a two-tailed test uh, is going to be more stringent. You're going to provide yourself better protection against type 1 error if you have a two-tailed test, whereas a one-tailed test is going to be more lenient. Recall when you were looking at the z-tables and looking up uh, probabilities of z-scores that if, you asked, if I asked you a question about what's the probability of getting a score just going in one direction, and then I change and say, well, what's the probability of getting that same score going more extreme in either direction? You just simply take that first score and double it. Uh, and so that's the same thing here, that uh, uh, going in one direction is just simply going to be half of what it is going in two directions, which means uh, that uh, things are more likely to be significant if you're only asking about it going in one direction, and if you're going in two directions, you're asking for a more stringent test, and it's less likely to be significant. Um, and in some ways, that might make us think, oh, well, why don't we do one-tailed tests? Because uh, it's more likely to be significant that way. That gives us more power. Um, and we can claim things are significant. Uh, but that's one of those things. If you use a one-tailed test and submit that, uh, do research and submit that to a journal, you'll probably get yourself in trouble. Because there's always this temptation to say, well, let's start off and do a two-tailed test. And if it's not significant, well, what happens if we do a one-tail test? It's a little more lenient. Oh, look at that. If we do a one-tail test, it's uh, significant. So I'll do that. And that's, that's kind of like cheating. And that's viewed as a bad thing. Um, and so whenever you report a one-tail test, people are going to look at you with a degree of mistrust. They're going to say, oh, did you cheat? Did you, you, did you really plan to do a one-tail test? Or were you actually just did a two-tailed test and it wasn't significant, and so you then tried to fudge things by saying, well, I'll do a one-tailed test just so you'd have something significant and so you'd have something to report. Um, so, uh, so out there in the mean, cruel world, one-tailed tests are looked at with suspicion. People don't like it, and you're likely to be mistrusted if you ever report it. So we will avoid that here, and we will never use one-tailed tests, scribble that out, scribble, scribble, scribble. We will never use one-tailed tests for this class. Whenever you look up significance, whenever you look up p-values for a t-test, I always want you to give me a two-tailed test. That's kind of the, the, the way things are typically done, uh, and uh, it'll keep you uh, uh, from getting in trouble uh, with reviewers, and, and it will make you so you give right answers when I ask you questions on tests and homeworks. So use a two-tailed test. And if you look at this table where it says significance for a two-tailed test, it has different columns here. And uh, let's start with the column that says 0.05. What this column gives is different uh, critical values uh, that we need given different degrees of freedom uh, so that we can say um, P is less than 0.05. Uh, to, and, P, and that would be significant. So if our P is less than 0.05, it means we have a significant t-test. It means that if the null hypothesis is true, the probability of getting an effect this big is something that would happen less than one, uh, less than five times in 100, less than 5% of the time. And when it uh, happens that infrequently, we say that's so unusual, we are going to reject that assumption of the null hypothesis and say, well, that null hypothesis probably wasn't true. Uh, because if it was, our data would look pretty, it'd be pretty atypical to get this big of effect. So we reject that null hypothesis, and that's when we're very happy, because that's what we wanted to do. We found something, we can reject the null hypothesis and say, in our study, we have found a result. And we have already seen in this study, we do indeed have a significant result. So we want to figure out, look at this column for 0.05, we want to figure out what is the critical value that would allow us to say P is less than 0.05, uh, given the degrees of freedom in our study. So our degrees of freedom options are listed in the left-hand column. 
And let's go back and look at our output and refresh our memory of our degrees of freedom, which is printed uh, 1,975 right here, 1,975. That's our degrees of freedom, total sample size minus 2. I'm just going to put that right up here, 1,975. There we go. So that's our degrees of freedom. Now, look at our options here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it goes down the bottom of the page. 50, 100, infinity. Uh, we do not have 1,975 as an option here. Uh, in fact, as you look at the table, for a very small sample size, you have every possible value. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then it starts skipping, and then towards the upper end, we're getting 30, 40, 50, and then it skips all the way from 50 to 100, and then from 100 to infinity. The reason for that is that you get the most, the differences, most of the changes in the shape of the T table occur at those smaller degrees of freedom values. Going from one to two, you get some change. From two to three, you get some change. But as your sample gets bigger and bigger, the changes get smaller and smaller. So the difference between 30 and 40 is actually not that big of a difference. Between 40 and 50 is not that big of a difference. And the difference between 100 and actually where it says infinity Actually, infinity is actually going to be the same thing as a z-table. At that point, there is no difference between a z and a t. Um, so that's why we skip things. But then that question comes, okay, what do we do when we have a sample size, say, of 1,975, but there's not that option on this table? We're going to have to round. And here's a point. When, when you do rounding on a t-table for degrees of freedom, I want to follow this rule that goes like this. Always round down, never round up. The reason for this is that when you're rounding, you're essentially saying how big of a sample you had. So you're going to say, well, I don't have the exact sample size here, so am I going to pretend that my sample is a little bit smaller or pretend that my sample is a little bit bigger? Well, if you pretend your sample is a little bit bigger, you're going to be inflating your type 1 error rate. You're going to be exaggerating things that are not really appropriate to do. And so even if uh, for example, even if you had the option between 50 and 100, and you had a sample size of, not, you had a degrees of freedom of 99, you had 101 people in your sample, so degrees of freedom was n minus 2, you had nine, a degrees of freedom of 99, I still say round down to 50, uh, because if you round up, you're inflating your sample size, and that's a no-no, we don't ever want to pretend we have more people than we actually had, let's be conservative, no matter what, always round down. So in this case, our options are 100 degrees of freedom or infinity. And we'll follow the rule, round down to 100 cases, which is a credible amount of rounding because we had 1,975 degrees of freedom and we're rounding all the way down to 100, which is pretty drastic. Although if you look at these values, you notice there's not a whole lot of difference. In fact, let's look here. So our critical value with 100 degrees of freedom, and look at this column for 0.05, and what I get is this is 1.984. That's our critical value. With, with 100 degrees of freedom, a critical value for saying P is less than 0.05 is 1.984. What that means is that when you calculate your T, if you get a T value of 1.984 or larger, it means your P is less than 0.05. And it always note that it always goes the direction of if your T gets larger, your P gets smaller. The bigger the T, the smaller the P. The smaller the P, the bigger your T. It goes opposite direction. So you want to have a great big T score and a little itsy bitsy P value. That means things will be significant. So that's what we want. So we need a T value that's at least 1.984. And if our T value is larger than that, we can say P is less than 0.05. In our case, what was our t value? Let's go back and look at what our t value was. Our t value was 4.31. Let me put this here, 4.31. It's kind of messy. I should say 4. Whoops, whoa, that was kind of a crazy one there. But 4.31. Use your imagination. That looks like 4.31. That's our t value. So 4.31 is larger than 1.984. Therefore, we can say P is less than 0.05. Uh, now, note a couple things here. First of all, note that there's hardly any difference, like I was saying here, that if we, if we, didn't, if we went to infinity, 
it would have 1.984 versus 1.96. So there's not much difference there between the two. Or if we round down to 50, 2.009, even that's not a whole lot of difference. So you can see that uh, even though we're, we're rounding down substantially, there's not that much difference in the t-values, and that's why they constructed the table this way. They saved a lot of space because it's really not all that different between, between the two rows. Um, also, a helpful tip to note, look at these t-values uh, for, for a lot of things here. They're all kind of in the general ballpark of two. Uh, for small samples, it's a little bit larger than two. For larger samples, they're all two or less than two. Um, once you get a much larger than 50, they're all going to be a little less than two. And that's kind of a, ha a helpful ballpark to keep in mind, is that any time you do a t-test, any time you get a t-value that's greater than two, it's probably going to be significant. Um, you almost don't even need to look it up, because uh, it's all going to be right around two. And it, for example, if you do a t-test, and you have a reasonable sample that's you know, anywhere bigger than 50 people or something like that, a reasonable sample, any t-test, and you get, say, 2.5, you, you don't have to look it up. You know that's going to be significant. Well, I might ask you for the p-value, in which case you would have to look it up uh, to answer the question on a test or homework. But in terms of real life stuff, it's not the type of thing you'd have to look up because you would just know off the top of your head, well, that t-value is 2.53 or 5 or 4, anything, you know, anything in that range. It, you, don't, you just know off the top of your head it's going to be significant. Um, but of course, for tests and homeworks, I might ask you for the precise value, so you have to look it up. Um, Okay, let me erase it. Let me see if I can do that a little bit neater here. I'm going to write 4.31. There we go. That was a little neater. Um, so we saw that our, our t exceeded our critical value, 1.984. So we can say p is less than 0.05. Well, now let's go on. Let's see, can we say, what can we say p is less than 0.02? Here, we, for that, our critical value is 2.364. Our p-value, 4.31, is indeed greater than 2.364, so we can say our p is less than 0.02. Now can we say p is less than 0.01? Can we say that? Uh, well, our critical value, 4.31, is greater than 2.626, so we can say p is less than 0.01. Well, can we say p is less than 0.001? Well, our critical value here is 3.390. Our t value is 4.31. 4.31 is greater than 3.390. So we can say p is less than 0.01. Um, so to answer these types of questions, if you're looking things up on a t table, uh, you can choose, in this case, you'd have uh, um, five options to choose for. Option one, it's not significant. Option two, p is less than 0.05. Option three, p is less than 0.02. Option four, p is less than 0.01. Option five, p is less than 0.001. And you would just choose from whichever option is the most precise p-value you can give me, the, the smallest p-value that you can claim. And that is how you would give me the p-value for this type of question. Uh, one more thing we might do with this is to do a confidence interval. So we already looked at our output here, said our, 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 we can be 95% confident that our mean difference, our mean difference is negative uh, 0.52. We can be 95% confident that in the, the true population, the true difference between the two groups is somewhere between negative 0.75 and negative 0.28. Um, now, I might scribble that out and say, here, I'll cover that up, and you tell me what that confidence interval is. You calculate the confidence interval. So recall that to calculate a confidence interval, you need a critical value and the standard error of difference. So the standard error of difference, right here, 0.12, and the critical value is the same critical value we just looked up on the previous page. This one right here, put an error of one point. 984. That's a critical value for p is less than 0.05. And for this class, I will always be asking for 95% confidence intervals, so you will always be using the p value of 0.05 for critical values. Uh, because the critical value for 0.05, um, 
0.05 right here. This critical, the, these critical values, so for example, the sample degree with 100 degrees of freedom, what this says is that 95% uh, uh, of the time your t-value will be less extreme than 1.984, and 5% of the time the t-values will be greater than this. Um, so that 0.05 critical value gives the point, gives you that cutoff uh, that tells you 95% of the cases will be smaller, 5% will be greater. And because I want the 95% confidence interval, we'll use P as point, the 0.05 critical value. If I wanted a different one, like if we wanted a 99% uh, confidence interval, we could use P as less than 0.01. So we could use different critical values if we wanted a different confidence interval. But for this class, I'm always going to ask for a 95% confidence interval. So you would always be looking at this column here for P is less than 0.05 and giving me those critical values. So 1.984. 1.984 is our critical value. So I'll plug that in right here. 1.984, that's our critical value. Our standard error of difference is 0.12. So multiply my critical value times the standard error of difference to get my bandwidth. And I get 2.382. So I can put that bandwidth around my standard, my, I'm sorry, I can put that bandwidth around the mean difference. So our difference was 0.52. So I can add that bandwidth and subtract that bandwidth to the mean difference. So 0.52 plus my bandwidth gives me negative 0.282. And the mean difference minus my bandwidth gives me negative 0.758. And uh, that's a bit off with rounding, but very, very close to what we had in our output right there. So that is how you would calculate uh, the confidence interval. Okay, here are some other types of questions that I might ask you to do. Uh, let's look at these. So question one says, in group X, for example, let's say group one, say the, uh, group one, the no education group. In the no education group, what is the distance that people score is typically deviated from the group mean? And that's a question, the thing to do is to look at that and realize, well, I am just asking you for the standard deviation. Standard deviation tells you how far scores typically deviate from the group mean. So that question is just asking you, what is a standard deviation? So the answer is 2.5 if I'm talking about group one, or uh, the, if I was talking about the education group, it would be 2.39. Um, let's see, what else? Number two, if this study were repeated over and over, how much would you typically expect the mean for group one, say, or group X, how, would you, how much would you expect the mean for group one to deviate from the true population mean for this group? And that is asking for the standard error of the mean. The standard error of the mean tells you how far the mean uh, from studies, from individual studies, typically deviates from the true population parameter. And so if I'm asking about the no education group, the standard error there mean is 0 0.07. So if I, if I was asking about the no education group, the answer would be 0 0.07. Question three, if the study were repeated over and over, how much would you typically expect the size of difference between the two groups to deviate from the true uh, difference in the population? So that's asking about the standard error of difference score. In this case, 0.12, right there. Question four, if the null hypothesis is true, if the null hypothesis is true, and based on the linear equations we discussed in class, what is the standardized, then I have E sub 1 minus 0 SP, that stands for the standardized error for the difference between groups 1 and 0, the, the, the difference between means in this, for sample S for popula from population P. Um, in other words, if we assume the null hypothesis is true, what is the standardized error for this study? And the thing to do there is to realize that, well, that's asking for the t-value. The t-value gives you a, a statistic for the study, in this case, the difference between means, divided by its standard error. A statistic divided by its standard error is a standardized uh, error for the study, and that's what a t-value is. So, uh, the, so number four is simply asking for the t-value, negative 4.31. That is a standardized error for the study, assuming the null hypothesis is true. If we don't assume that, we'd, we, uh, 
uh, don't know what the standardized error is, but that's under the assumption of the null hypothesis. And then number five says, based on the linear equations discussed in class, what is the average deviation for, uh, for E sub 1 minus 0 SP, the average absolute error? Uh, and that is the standard error of difference. Recall the standard error of difference tells you how far studies typically deviate from the true population parameter. What is the typical amount that, of error that you make in most studies? That's what the standard error of difference tells you. So the answer to number five is 0.12, standard error of difference. Okay, we've asked, uh, we've done a lot of stuff with this sample here. Uh, let's take a step back here and, and do some summarizing things uh, or look at some types of questions that I might ask you to give me some broad summaries of what we found here. Um, and one of the things that we w might want to ask is simply generally, what did we find? I, we had a hypothesis. There would be a difference between the two groups. Uh, did we find a difference between these two groups in their levels of commitment? Did we find that the people that received education uh, were happier or more committed than the ones who did not receive education? And how would you answer that question? And when you answer this type of question, what I want you to do is to give me five pieces of information or basically boil down to give me an effect size uh, give me the name of the statistic for an effect size, and give me a value for an effect size. Then give me the name of the statistic you're going to use to do an inferential statistic, and the value you get for that statistic, and then the p-value you get for your inferential statistic. So five things, the name of the effect size, the value for the effect size, the name of the inferential statistic, the value, and the p-value. So in this case, the effect size, the name is D. Uh, the name of the effect size is the D statistic. Now, we could do a point by zero correlation, and that would be le a legitimate way to report the effect size. But by default, I always want you to give me a D statistic if we're comparing differences between two groups in their means. So if I'm looking at mean differences um, between two groups, by default, the effect size will be a D, because the D is an easier effect size to interpret a correlation uh, it's mathematically just fine, but it's a little bit harder to wrap your mind around exactly what it means when you're looking at a difference between two groups. So by default, always give me a D statistic when I ask for an effect size for a difference between two groups, and only give me a point by zero correlation if I specifically tell you give me a point by zero correlation. So the effect size is a D statistic, and we already calculated that. We know our D is negative 0.21. So name of effect size, D, value, negative 0.21. Next part, what about the inferential statistic? Our inferential statistic will be a t value. So the name of the statistic is the t, and the value will be negative 4.31. That's what we saw here. Our t value is negative 4.31. And then what is the probability of that t value assuming the null hypothesis is true? What is our p value? What is our significance? Well, we don't know exactly. Uh, something rounds to 0. 0.000. Uh, now, there's two things. When, when you uh, give me the p-value, uh, if it's in a homework or on a test and I, uh, uh, where I say, look at the results and tell me what the p-value is, uh, I will often say, give it to me just exactly as it's printed. That's because sometimes we'll have very small values, like here we got 0, 0.00. There might be a situation where I have one that's 0 0.001, another that's 0 0.002, and I want to make sure that you're looking at the correct p-value. So when I ask for p-values, I will often have, and sometimes it'll be in great big bold statements saying, report exactly as it's printed. And if I say that, Make sure you give it exactly as it's printed. Uh, sometimes on Canvas, that might even be uh, set up at, to be a spelling uh, item. Uh, in terms of Canvas, I'll we'll think it's a spelling item, and it'll be looking for specific characters uh, that are period zero, zero, zero. Um, note that it, you might actually get it wrong. If you were to write 0, 0.000, even though mathematically, of course, that's the same thing, uh, or if you just write zero, uh, but on Canvas, it would probably mark you wrong for that because it's looking for exactly zero point or exactly period zero zero zero. No extra spaces. Don't do space period zero zero zero. Don't do anything else. Do just exactly point zero zero zero. So if I say give it exactly as printed, make sure you do it just exactly as it's printed in the output. Now, 
In just a moment, I'm going to talk about what to do, how to give a written summary of these results. And when we get there, I'm going to tell you something totally different, because when we're doing a written summary, I never want you to write P is equal to 0 .000, because that makes no sense, because P can't be zero. So uh, when we talk about written summaries, I'm going to have you use an inequality. If you get a really, really small P value, I'm going to have you say P is less than 0 .001. But, um, but if, we're doing, if I'm having you answer a question on Canvas or on a test where I say, what is the p-value exactly as printed, then give it exactly as printed. Um, another type of question I'm likely to do sometimes, and actually we'll do this with this unit, and this will keep popping up over and over again throughout this course, where I'll say, okay, overall, how would you describe this effect? And I will give you options that say, not significant, trivial, uh, small, medium, large. And I want you to pick from one of those options to describe the effect. And so to answer that question, the first thing is to figure out, is this significant, yes or no? If it is significant, then give me an effect size, sm trivial, small, medium, large. If it's not significant, stop there. Just say it's not significant. Don't talk about an effect being small, trivial, medium, or large if it's not significant. If we can't reject the null hypothesis, if we can't rule out the possibility that the effect might be exactly zero, then we're not going to talk about an effect size at all. So if it's not significant, just say not significant, stop there. If it is significant, if your P is less than 0.05, then, then go on to say, okay, well, is it trivial, small, medium, or large? In this case, our effect size, our D is 0.21, and that would be a small effect. So the answer to that would be we have a small effect. The effect is best described as small. And like I said just a moment ago, I want to talk about what you would do uh, to give me a written summary of these results. So here is an example of how to write up these results and give me a written summary. So here I have, uh, there was a significant difference between the couples that had premarital education and the couples that did not. That's my first phrase there. Um, and uh, there's a couple key words here. I have a difference between, and then I describe my two groups, the couples that had education and the ones that did not. And those words, difference between, I don't know how you could say this and use different words than that. Uh, if you could think of a way, that might be fine, but I, I can't think of how that's, how that's possible. So I think pretty much you have to say difference between, because I want you to clarify you're looking at a difference between two groups. Is this group different from that group? So this is a test looking for a difference between groups. So somewhere in that phrase, you have to say difference between. So this first phrase, you use the words difference between to clarify we're looking at a difference between two groups. And I want you to tell the reader what those two groups are. We have one group that had premarital education and another group that did not. Um, uh, you could, there's a few different, you know, you could say there was a difference between the education group and the no education group. There might be a few different ways you could word that. Uh, all of those possibilities would use the words difference between and they would name the two groups. Uh, so those, that's the key there. Also, uh, if it is significant, make sure you say it's significant. And if it's uh, not significant, then you would say there is not a significant, or there, or there was a non-significant difference, or just say there was not a significant difference between uh, the couples that had education and those that dif didn't, if that was the case. Um, for written summaries, more often than not, just about all things, especially on tests and things, I will probably be giving you examples where there's significant results. Um, if you're ever taking a test and, and, I, and you're doing a written summary and you're looking at things and it comes up that there's not a significant difference, a good tip is go back and double check because it would be unlikely, it's, it's possible, it, it, might be, it might be that I gave you a non-significant example, but that's pretty rare. It's very, very unlikely. Um, that's something that I might do only maybe once every 10 years or something like that by accident. Um, and uh, so if, if you get a, uh, uh, a written summary, if I'm asking you to do a written summary on a test, most likely I'm going to be giving you an example where there's actually a significant difference. But if you're ever in a situation where it's not significant, then say there was not a significant difference between the groups. So I've labeled whether it's significant or not. I've used the word difference between, and I've named my two groups. The next thing I'm going to do in parentheses 
is give those five pieces of information that we just talked about. The name of my effect size, the effect size value, the name of the inferential, the inferential value, and the p-value. And I'm going to put all that in parentheses here. So I'm going to say D, and uh, in, SP, in uh, APA style, usually all your um, abbreviations for statistics should be in italics. And so that should be in italics D, although if you're giving me a handwritten uh, summary on a, uh, on a test, I won't be able to tell what's italics or not, so you wouldn't need to worry about that. Um, but, uh, but technically, it should be italics. So D equals 0.21. So that's the name of our, our effect size and the value for effect size. And then there's a comma. And then I'm going to give the inferential statistic. Uh, now, one thing about the inferential statistic for the t-test, and we'll see the same thing when we look at others like an f-test, is that uh, according to APA format, APA style, you always give the degrees of freedom. So I say t, and right after I write the letter t in parentheses, I put the degrees of freedom. And that will always be true. Every time you talk about, uh, this will be true, for example, later on, we'll talk about f-test, and we'll say f in parentheses, degrees of freedom. Uh, in this class, we won't deal with chi-squares so much. But if you did do a chi-square, you do the same thing, right? Chi-square, parentheses, degrees of freedom. So whenever you report a, uh, a test statistic, uh, doing a significance test, uh, you always put the degrees of freedom in parentheses right after you name the statistic. So T and degrees of freedom, 1,975. And we just automatically know that's degrees of freedom. And that can also make you a savvy, a savvy, a savvy, a savvy, uh, a savvy reader of journal articles uh, to keep in mind that anytime you see an inferential statistic, the degrees of freedom are in parentheses, because then you will know that that value in parentheses, degrees of freedom, which in this case is our sample size minus two. So you know that this is a test based on 1,975 plus two people. And sometimes when you're reading journal articles, you might see a situation where someone reports a degrees of freedom that don't match the sample size they reported when they were giving you the sample size. Uh, and probably what happened is maybe some people dropped out or maybe some people didn't complete that part of the study or whatever happened. Uh, but that will make you aware that, oh, there's some people got lost here. And a lot of times people will write journal articles and they won't tell you that. Uh, and if you see that, say, hmm, I can detect that something happened here. It'll make you a detective and you can say, ha, huh, I can detect you lost some people there. Or if you're reviewing an article, you might see it and say, hmm, you obviously lost some people there. What happened? I would like you to tell me what happened. Where, where, where these people go? Uh, so name of inferential statistic and the degrees of freedom and then the value. Our T value was 4.31. Uh, note that I've dropped the negative signs for both the D and the T here. Uh, it's fine. If you want to put the negative signs in, it's fine to do that. If you want to leave them out, you can do that. Uh, both the D and the T uh, are two situations where the negative signs are simply arbitrary. Uh, it's just a matter of which, which mean did you put first, which one did you put second, and if we reverse the order, we would reverse the sign on both the D and the T. So both the D and the T are the two... Um, can't think offhand if there's others in this class that we'll talk about, but, but those are the two statistics that, uh, 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 where the, the negative, positive or negative signs are actually arbitrary. You want to keep those negative signs when you're entering them on Canvas, but if you're giving me a written summary, uh, I don't care if you keep them or not. And then we have our p-value, our p, and this point, this is where I do not want you to say p is equal to zero. Uh, down here at the bottom, I want to look at this down here. So I want you to round everything to two decimal places uh, with the possible exception of p-value. So if the p-value is less than 0.01, then round it to three decimal places. And if the p-value is less than 0.01, then simply print p is less than 0.001. And never print p is equal to 0.000. That's the thing, if, if it's a test or if it's a, uh, entering stuff on Canvas and I say, give me the p-value exactly as printed on that question, then I want you to give me whatever's printed there. But for a written summary, if you're giving me a written summary of the results, never print p is equal to zero or p is equal to zero, zero, zero. Never print that. So in this case, I have write p is less than 0 0.001 uh, because it just said, it just rounded to zero on the SPSS output. 
So I've given you, uh, we've clarified, we're looking at a difference between groups. I've named the groups. I've given you my five piece of information. Uh, now I'm going to continue on. Actually, this whole summary is, is actually boils down to just uh, one long sentence and one short sentence. We're still working on this first sentence here. The next thing I want to do is uh, clarify what the outcome variable is. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could have even put that, we could have put that up earlier if you wanted to. We could have said there was a significant difference between the couples that had pre education and the couples that did not in their levels of commitment. We could have worded it something like that. That gets a bit wordy, but we could have put it up there. But we need to tell a reader, what is our outcome variable? We're, we're looking at difference between groups in what? We're looking at a difference between groups in commitment. Uh, that was the outcome variable, how much commitment they reported. Uh, so I want to clarify what that outcome was, and I want to tell the reader which group scored higher and which group scored lower. So the premarital education couples reported more commitment than the couples receiving no premarital education. Which, by the way, one thing to always keep in mind when you're writing uh, in a scientific style, uh, the word more or less is always a contrast. Never use the word more without saying more than what, or never say less than saying less than what. Um, if I just said with the premarital education couples reporting more commitment, period, uh, that would be a bad sentence because I wouldn't be telling the reader more, more than what. I need to say more than the couples receiving no education. So, what I'm doing in this phrase here, I've clarified that we're looking, the outcome variable, we're looking at the difference between groups and levels of commitment, so I've clarified what that variable is. And I've said which group is higher and which group is lower. The premarital education couples reported more, and the couples receiving no education couples reported less. Or the, uh, the couples with education reported more than the couples with no education. Um, also note that in this example, I use the words reporting, and that's because that's what was done in the study, that the study was uh, based on uh, people were uh, interviewed over the telephone and they were asked how much commitment, they asked questions about their level of commitment in their relationship. Uh, so I use the word reporting because that's what was done in the this, in this study. I would not use the word reporting if that wasn't part of the study design. For example, if I did an observational study and I was observing people to see, maybe I was looking at how far people could throw tomatoes or something, and I was observing how far, it was maybe measuring the distance of the tomatoes that got thrown. Uh, in that case, I would say, with well, the people in this group threw, further, or threw uh, uh, tomatoes a greater distance or were observed to throw tomatoes a greater distance, but I wouldn't say they reported something because I wasn't asking them any questions. Um, so make sure that you use words that match the design of your study. If you're asking people to report something, then use a word like reporting, but if you're observing something, then use a word like observing. So make sure the language matches the study design, matches what was actually done. Now, another thing that I've stuck in here in parentheses are means and standard deviations for each group. I have, uh, so the couples reporting, with a premarital education couples reporting more commitment, and then I give the mean and the standard deviation for that group. So the mean, 11.64, standard deviation, 2.39, and I just abbreviate the mean, a capital, actually it's italics, a capital italics M for the mean, capital italics SD for standard deviation, and I give you the mean and the standard deviation for uh, the premarital education couples. And then when I talk about the ones with no education, I give you the mean and the standard deviation for that group. Um, one thing that to keep uh, in mind here and that I can be picky about that I really, it drives me nuts when people uh, do it this way or don't follow uh, what I want you to do. And that is make sure you follow a sequence in which you tell me what group you're talking about, for example, here we've got the pre-education couples, that's naming what group we're talking about, and telling me what the outcome variable is, commitment. So make sure I know what group you're talking about and what the outcome variable is before you tell me what the mean and the standard deviation is. So the mean standard deviation need to come at the point right after you told me I'm talking about this group and I'm talking about this outcome variable. Uh, don't word things in a way that say, uh, here's the mean of the standard deviation, and oh, by the way, that mean standard deviation apply to this group uh, for this outcome variable. Um, I mean, technically, there's nothing wrong with doing that in terms of you're still conveying the same information, 
But in terms of the perspective of a reader, that's very hard to read uh, because what you're do if, you, if you put the mean standard deviation before you tell a reader what the group is and what the variable is, that means the reader has to keep that information in mind until you get around to telling you what a group. Um, it's like, you know, if I were to tell you, oh, yes, there was this other study. I went down uh, to the elementary school, actually, a few days ago, and I did this study, and, um, and the uh, uh, mean for the group was 5.68, and the standard deviation is 1.3 uh, in the study, and um, it was uh, looking at uh, the, the group was uh, uh, children in kindergarten versus children in first grade, and I was looking at how far they could throw tomatoes measured in yards. Now, the way I said that, I gave you all the information, but I'm sure by the time I got to the end, you have forgotten what the mean was and what the standard deviation was. Uh, to make sense of that, you would have to then go back and say, okay, now that you finally told me what variables we were talking about, I have to go back and figure out what the mean and standard deviation was. So make sure you, it's a lot easier if I just say, uh, I was looking at the number of yards that kindergartners and first graders could throw tomatoes, and the, the kindergartners threw tomatoes, uh, um, a mean of uh, 5.8 yards, or whatever the number was. That's a lot easier to remember than if I tell you the mean starvation before I tell you the name of the group. So that, hopefully that makes sense. But that's a very, very common mistake to make. So what you don't want to do, let's look and see how that would play out here. Do not say, with the premarital education couples right here, do not, where I'm drawing this circle, do not put your mean there. Don't say, with the premarital education couples, mean 11.64 standard deviation 2.39 reporting more commitment do not do that because that has a mean coming before you've told me you're talking about commitment so make sure you first tell me you're talking about commitment before you give me the mean then we're ready for our last sentence which is very short we simply want to tell the reader what the effect was. Was it a trivial effect, small effect, medium effect, large effect? This represents a small effect. So simply tell the reader, interpret that effect size in terms of small, medium, or large. Um, now, I mentioned that I will, it would be highly unlikely that I would give you an example for a test that would uh, require you to deal with a non-significant difference between groups. But if you, if you are dealing with a non-significant difference, uh, just note a few things here. First, you would say there is not... You would need to put the word, there was not a significant difference between groups. And uh, where it says more, you would want to say similar. Uh, maybe probably it's S-I-M. -I should be similar. Uh, I don't know if that looks, does that look like similar? Maybe it does. It should be not more, but a similar, uh, reporting similar commitment to the couples uh, in the no education group. And then you would simply not report. In fact, just drop that whole last sentence. Don't say anything about effect size. Drop it all together. Um, so that is what you would do if you had a, a non-significant difference between groups. And actually, that is everything for this uh, first example, and we're ready to move on to the second example.